wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, featuring your hosts, Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is all about Bridget's doco and showing up in this world as a woman and a mother. Before that, I'd just love to remind you to jump on to nourishingthemother.com.au and sign up to join our tribe, where once a week we'll send you a wrap-up email with links and blurbs to everything we've put out in the world so you can pick and choose what you'd love to dive deeper into. And occasionally we send you a second one, like a conversation we'd have between each other with a bit of an awakening epiphany, a toolkit, a discussion Mm. about something that's lit us up. So please sign up to join our tribe at nourishingthemother.com.au. Bridget, last night I had the great honour of turning up to your premiere open screening for the documentary that you were in with Jess Jones from Saw Collective. Mm. Just even, like I, I'm sure for most of our li- listeners that's a bit of an out of the blue, didn't know you were even doing a doco, Bridget. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about how oh, that came came yeah. yeah, sure. So for those of you who follow both Suburban Sun Castles and Nourishing the Mother, you will know that back in May this year, I took a road trip um, with my friend Jess and baby Sylvie and her baby Mabel. Um, and it was a road trip over 2,000 kilometres up the east coast of Australia. And it was all about um, shining a light on regional women in business who were kind of paving their own way in the world. Um, and it was really intense it was challenging we were incredibly fortunate to have massive crowdfunding support and support from some big brands to get it over the line but it was something that I said yes to when Sylvie was just four months old and it was I can't even wrap my head uh, around that but, but to me though this is just this whole thing is so um an example of really like the, the way that I've chosen to parent this time with Sylvie in terms of really trying to stay connected and, and present to her as much as staying connected and present to myself and to my mm. big dreams because I really uh, I didn't really take any time off with her like you know you and I and yeah, same yeah, with yeah. you right like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know we're really just kind of continuing to stretch ourselves continuing to kind of find those edges of comfort mm. and discomfort and totally the road trip did that for me you know, like Jess and I have some some pretty different values around some things, and you know, facing that, um, the mirror of that can be can be hard sometimes. But- you've done a lot of work on that, though. I mean, I know you'd spend a lot of time. Um, connecting with collaborators that could support your drive for nourishment. Totally, yeah, yeah. You know, you're with the Thank You brand for nappies and wipes. Yeah. Like, I saw a lot of that. Do you want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah. yeah, because I think for me what I was really, really conscious of was was the, um, the incredible ask that it was of the babies to come on this journey because it, it's, a, it's a long trip. We weren't going to have a lot of spaciousness for them in it because even when we were stopped, we were like trying to run events and, you know, running to a really tight shed. Schedule. We were staying at five different accommodation places throughout the five days, and you know, as you know, like babies are super aware, mm. so they're so so um, tuned in to their environment, and so that the change in environment can be really um, destabilizing for a baby. So I think what I was really conscious of was looking after their nutritional needs as much as much as possible, and in turn looking after our nutritional needs, knowing that mm. the better we look after ourselves the better we're going to be able to show up for them and for, for the task at hand. Mm. And I noticed that you interviewed the um, woman who started up in Dota and that was almost her message too, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. The really whole, was. It was almost the ethos in her business was – to be and I really got that clear message mm. from you was after all of this work you got to this point you were running late for your Indota appointment it was almost at the point where you were like we're just going to chuck the towel in and forget it yeah but there was that this wasn't an really <laughs> no this is but even in that docu you said there was this yeah. real conscious moment for you where you consciously went no I've got nothing to give unless I put back in and yeah. you then very consciously carved the space and the time out yeah to receive mm. and it was really about that it was a, it was about saying to myself and, and along the whole journey really was was really making that choice to put myself, you know, first in a way that meant that I could then give out, and you know, and, and even if that meant you know, having the, having a drink of water before I gave to Sylvie, or kind of having a, a meal, or, or saying to Jess, no, I need to stop, like oh, I need to eat, or I need this, or or you know, really really finding my voice within within that trip and and How using hard? it. How hard was that? Um, we were really open with each other and had so many deep conversations about each of our own lives and values and the challenges we face and, and, 
and, and, you know, interesting conversations between how different we are but also how we also have kind of big visions and big dreams at the same time. So I think because we were so open about it, it made it so much easier as opposed to, you know, one of us stewing over something or, you know, one of us going silent or anything like that. Was that something you'd set up prior to the road trip? I think both of us were pretty clear with each other that we knew we'd have to maintain open dialogue and I knew that that for me to really get um, the most out of it and also be able to give as much as my, of myself as I wanted to, I was going to have to be honest with that, you know, and really find a way to get everyone's needs met and fulfil the project in a way that was still aligned to what I value because it wouldn't have been aligned for me to forget, my, you know, my values around nutrition or not get good enough sleep or make Sylvie do things that I didn't think were okay, like, you know, palm her off to anybody or, you know, I was, I was really tuned in to what she needed, which meant sometimes that, that I probably did more babysitting than interviewing because I, if she wasn't comfortable in a situation, I wasn't going to force her into being helped by someone she didn't want to be helped by. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. So really trying to find that sweet spot um, between what the project needed and what she needed and what I needed to be able to give all of myself to that. That's such a lot to be thinking about. The mental load was pretty intense. And then you get, and then adding that to the driving, like there was one night where we were driving in the dark for a long time, or two nights actually driving in the dark for a long time. And I haven't, because, you know, the nature of being a mother of young children, I don't get out of the town yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. So I don't spend a lot of time driving at night. And so that was really hard. Like I found that really hard to focus and to um, be safe on the road and yeah. being so tired and so stretched and having so much going on. Yeah. So even you know, the, the driving time on top of everything else was was taxing mm. yeah and you know the night breastfeeding and the night waking and because you were also sharing a house essentially because you were also sponsored by airbnb yeah with the videographers yep yep with jess and her baby and mm-hmm. you and your baby so i remember you saying to me there was a consciousness around well i can't do a wake crying no. and hold her space to cry because i've got other people in the house to think about yeah so yeah. how did you kind of survive that during that week and then certainly afterwards yeah it was an interesting one because I was conscious of that and in fact one of the episodes that we did just before we went on the road trip was when was that one around baby sleep that was it was the episode where I was like taken to my edges with Sylvie like yeah, I was really yeah. struggling and I was it was all about the fact that I couldn't stop um co-sleeping because the fact was I was going to have to co-sleep on the road trip so why change it um, however, I did change it, and in fact, she slept really well. Because you ended up changing it only a couple of weeks beforehand. Didn't a you? week, wow. a week before we went, I moved her into her own room, and and almost, I think, I'm pretty sure I I, I almost night weaned, so I got down to like one feed. That's right, you did. I remember. Yeah. That now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So on the road trip, I maintained that. So she, so I only fed her once, and it was lucky she she really did. I think because it was so taxing, she slept quite well. Yeah. Um, I also tried where I could find quiet spaces and opportunities to really ke- have moments of connection time and listening to tears where I could, so that she was going to going to bed with a you know full cup in that sense as much as possible. It didn't happen every day, but but at least tuning into where she was at was key because I knew she'd sleep better if she had had that release. Gosh, you're really doing a lot of balancing there. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, and it was hard. Like, there were some days where I, you know, was frustrated and there were some, you know, moments where I really did have to sit with that, you know, like discomfort of feeling challenged, you know, like, you know, around my values, around, um, you know, was this fair for Sylvie? Was this, you know, was I really, was this really where I wanted to be? And I I think wherever we really truly test ourselves, that's where we're going to find ourselves dialoguing you know because we we are turning over different ideas in our head where we're having to face stuff that that perhaps is uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and that was a you know real theme of that road trip and in fact you know even in the film you could really see that coming out for me was that that turning over of the mother I want to be and then this business woman or this kind of big dreamer that I that I inherently am as well Mm -hmm. and finding and, and balancing the tension between those two things at the same time as is fueling myself as a person to give to those two those two areas of my life, um, and I don't think that I necessarily had the clear answers out of that. And I think it's a, a common tension that so many mothers face. You know, how do I give of myself um, in a way that's fulfilling for me and serving my family and the world in, in the way that I want? 
What do you think about that when you think about showing up in this world? What do you think about? What are the themes that come up for you? Courage. You're finding the courage to show up um, as you are, even when you don't have all the answers. I I think it's a bit of an illusion that stops so many people from um, doing what they want or or taking a leap uh, because we think that we somehow need to be like the expert or the, the person who knows all. But I don't think you ever are that. I think that you're always evolving and... And so it's about showing up and meeting the world where you are and in who you are right now mm. um, and, and serving those who are, who are ready for your message, wherever that message is going to go. I mean, that was one of the questions in the Q&A was someone had said, you know, I see that, you know, you and Jess showing up a lot in the world. You know, how do you um, get over, like, your fear of doing that? And like I said, like accepting that that no matter who I'm in front of or what I say, there's going to be people who both like what I say and don't like what I say and like what I do and don't like what I do. And I will never, ever please everybody. So I may as well do what feels most aligned to me because at least then I'll feel connected to myself. How do you get rid of those um, other voices in your mind that say, well, you shouldn't or you couldn't or, you know, like a big theme on that, I did see a lot of the women that you interviewed on the road trip and please fill in, you know, the blanks about what you really took out of yeah. those interviews because they all said they're still facing that inner critic mm. that you can't, you shouldn't, you da 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 So how are you doing that? Accepting that I think that that will never go away. Mm. Like, So obviously we have a toolkit that we work through that. So we, you know, you and I are constantly looking at, okay, where are my shoulds coming from? You know, who is the shoulda? Because yes. the shoulder's not me. Yeah. Right? The shoulder is some kind of, you know, some paradigm, culture, that I'm running, you parent know, person, parent person yeah. belief system, school teacher that I had internalized from when I was seven and didn't realize, you know, like yeah. there's so many layers there. So getting conscious of your shoulds. Getting conscious of them. And first. so when you've recognized a should, how are you bringing yourself back into soulful or authentic mm. alignment? Mm. Um, really sitting with why I'm attaching to that should because often there's a strategy around why we're using the should because mm, tell me about that well and I know this is certainly for, a pattern for me if I subordinate to who I think are like the authorities around deeply attuned connected parenting or the right way that I see to consciously parent and I don't meet those then I'm going to continually find new ways to learn more and connect more with my children which keeps me on that path of really conscious parenting Mm. so my perception of not knowing enough there or my perception of not being connected enough fuels me to stay to value to really value connection it also means that if I feel like I'm taking too much away from that role that I really see my my, um mothering play then (coughs) excuse me um then I won't take that big leap in business that I'm too scared to take Mm. so there, there's the shoulds perform a strategy as well like they keep us safe in our perception of the part which we don't feel ready to step into yet so they're not they're there to be understood they're not there to be completely acknowledged mm. i think it's on some level making friends with the shoulds by understanding why you're, why you why they're there and what they're there for to you know for your own consciousness mm. and for you know for your own evolution and so you're on this road trip. What was your greatest high and your greatest low? Biggest high. I think the biggest high was the final event. So it was the event in Sunshine Coast. And it was with this super dyna- dynamic woman called Tess Lehman, who's got an interesting story because she's one of seven children and her mum ended up splitting up with her dad when she, when she was 37 after, sorry, after 37 years of marriage and then became like a sexologist and like kind of really found her sexuality. And so Tess has got an interesting perspective on her own mother, mother's journey of awakening mm-hmm. and therefore how she's taken that into her own story. And, and even though her values around mothering are different to mine, I loved her um, honesty and her, and her humour around the whole balancing of motherhood and business. Mm-hmm. Because I just thought there's, there's, there's really a, not enough of that sometimes, you know, in, in terms of just – because she was funny. She was saying, you know, it doesn't matter what 
You do. There's going to be something. Your kids will still turn around, you know, in 20 years' time and say, you that time when I was 10 and you didn't. Yeah. You know, you weren't there for me. You know, and, you know, us as mothers who are particularly trying to be these conscious mothers, it could break us, right, if we don't have the perspective that, yes, whatever we do, our kids are still going to find fault. And so that reminder, I think, is really a reminder for us to find softness and playfulness in motherhood and to drop the seriousness sometimes if we really do have that, that value on, on listening and connectedness and all of those kinds of things. Um, and it was also at the time that I really was able to let go. Like Sylvie had really got into a rhythm. She was, you know, she played like with Jess's dad through that whole event and was super happy. And, and that was also a, um, a, a point at which I'd reached around letting go and trusting that if she was happy, I'm happy, you know, and, and, and really finding that, 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 that nice rhythm. Separateness. That, separateness, mm. yeah. And, you know, she was still a really independent baby at nine months old. And, and yeah, so there was, there was a real um, sense of fulfilment getting to that final stop and that final event um, after a pretty intense week and just knowing that the next day we were going to be able to go and have a, have a drink on the water in Noosa mm. and just chill out. And, you know, even, even that day, like, I, I left Sylvie for a nap with Jess's stepmom and and not knew that she's comfortable enough for me to go and, and and even for me like this is a world away of how how I would have been with my son for example and yeah you know, I think about the evolution of myself on uh, in motherhood and and where I find myself in you know parenting silly versus as a baby versus parenting Hugo as a baby in that journey of self and really sit in a place of kind of gratitude for that growth um, what do you think that is? What do you think is the defining difference between being unable to let go mm. um, and know that you're the only person who can look after your baby or that it's safe or right that that's the way it should be versus being able to go, she's okay mm. with the person that I don't have a strong relationship with. Like, mm. where? what is that? I think it's noticing what was my stuff and what is actually truth. And so much of what I see as my approach with Hugo as a baby was um, noticing my need to be needed um, in motherhood, which mm. I think is a really classic one. Mm. And also that my intentions might be one thing, but how my child perceives it is going to be totally different and that my mm. child has a unique journey in this world too um, and, and, is, and needs to be allowed the space to make meaning independently of of me trying to control that meaning for them. And that even begins in babyhood. And, and I think, as we know with, with really listening to tears, it's not so much what happens to us, but it's how we perceive it and it's also how we're given space to heal. And as we know, there's always space to heal. So even if she did have a difficult afternoon with someone, I'm, I know how to look for the signs of that and I know how to create space to listen. Mm. So knowing that just like me, she also grows at the border of support and challenge. She's going to benefit even from being challenged in those moments, perhaps by, by having a caregiver that, that she doesn't know or by crying to me and I'm not there. Mm. Those are moments that also benefit her. She's not a poor, innocent baby who needs her mother by her side all of the time. She doesn't need that. She just needs someone to listen um, and someone to care for her and as much as possible that's me but sometimes it's not because I also need to look after me mm-hmm. and I just need to do what matters to me so that I can be there more wholly for her. So I think that that's been a big um, evolution of understanding perhaps between the two babies. Do you think or do you see women around you sacrificing who they are in service of their family and their baby? Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I th- and I think on some level it's it's celebrated, right? Like in terms of of motherhood being or consuming or motherhood being of service all of the time, mm. and and the woman in motherhood almost in some ways are losing herself in that mm. need to constantly provide. I don't know that there's a lot out there that says 
hey, the more you honour you and put back into you, the more you can give. That, 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 that's a peripheral message. It is. It's often said as that airbag one, isn't it? That, yeah. you know, in a plane crash, you put your own mask on before your baby. Yeah. But I wonder why that depth of conviction isn't there that follows through with that statement. What do you think mm. about that? I guess it's why, you know, words are a lot easier to, to, to kind of, you know, spat out than actions, right? Mm. Um, because what it actually means in the day-to-day of mm. putting back in for self before in service of others is the challenge. Is the yeah, and it's also how am I going to be perceived if I, like, don't immediately give to my child but instead, like, look after what I need, like, who might judge me then? Or, mm. you know, like, what kind of stories am I running about that not being okay? And judging myself. And judging myself, which will be based on some kind of belief that you've taken on board. Um, mm. You know, one of the things that Jess, uh, Jess and I talked a lot about, you know, what's the, what would be the hardest thing that someone could call you that you would struggle owning, mm. um, struggle with owning? We do that in L2L. We do a yeah, lot, yeah. And yeah. That's, that's why I was talking about yeah, it. Yeah, we with talk her. about our biggest shame word. The shame word. Yeah. And she said it was selfish. And I thought that that was so interesting because, you know, her, her, her dogged focus on her business could be perceived by some as selfish because she was focusing on that at that particular time as number one and then her kids were sitting in the family kind of second. Yeah. Um, and particularly if we do look at the paradigm of like mothers as service and mothers as putting themselves last, she was not doing that. And so therefore by some judgments, she was selfish. And so for her, that was a shame word she really had to come to terms with but and she's she, I mean, she's brilliant at, at not letting those kinds of things stick but it was an interesting conversation to have because uh, certainly the media would be quite happy to call a mother who's going after her dreams um as selfish compared to you know a father who might be going after his dreams you know mm. they might they might see him as wow what a thoughtful provider Mm, that's versus, a really interesting parallel, you know, versus actually. versus the mother who is going mm. out and doing that. Mm. And, and I, I mean, I, I still sit with that, you know, in an uncomfortable place. Like I look at some of the incredible um, entrepreneurial women in the world who are also kind of having lots of babies, and I'm thinking, wow, like that's pretty amazing. But there's part of me that's like, is it okay? You know, like the kids mm. of my mother is around, like the baby and the the child and the early childhood period. Connectedness, yeah, yeah. that. And then I notice, any, you know, my judgments that come up are just simply just based on my own patterning and experience. So, yeah, it's interesting to sit with some of those 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 angles that come up for us. Mm. What about messages that you've taken from the women that you interviewed? Because, I mean, you had enormous mm. access to some pretty incredible women mm. up the whole east coast of Australia. Yeah. What were kind of the main, the key themes or messages that you took from those women? Mm. There was an enormous amount of resilience I found in so many of the women. And so what many do you mean the, by resilience? In terms of, of their attitude to, to failure, in inverted commas, and also for, for many of them facing incredible discrimination in terms of what, what they were trying to do in business and how that wasn't being accepted by a lot of male peers or a lot of the end, the, the, struct, the way that an industry might have been structured to really not be supportive of the woman in motherhood or the woman in pro, you know, going and having a baby. Mm. And their continued um, persistence to, to still get the outcome that they wanted, to mm. still not, not kind of toe the line, I found that inspiring. Mm. Because, that, because in many ways and in many different forms, that was what their message was, was that Sometimes the world's not going to support you. Sometimes you're on your own with what you want to do, but but don't don't give up on it mm. because there's some reason why that there's that fire inside you. And so many of them did have that have that you know determination to carve out a business because they deeply were inspired to, and some of them because they had to because their circumstances had changed in their families, and then they had to look at for ways to provide, and they wanted to provide in a way that was flexible. They could still be around for their children and. And they got creative, you know, like, what is it, what's that saying? The you know, necessity is the motherhood of, mother of invention. Mm. And there were quite a few women who found themselves at that place too, which I found enormously inspiring. Mm. You know, to be, to be at that crossroads of challenge and still find opportunity and, 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 and turn potentially grief or pain into service, mm. you know, when you could really be, be really easy to go the other way. It'd be really easy to be the victim, it'd be really easy to kind of make it all, it's all too hard, or go and choose a safe road. You know, these are women who are, who are really trying to, 
to pave a pave an uncharted territory. Why do you think that is? What's the difference between between those that find opportunity in this struggle and those that well, it's still opportunity though, isn't it? Those that take a safer route. Mm. I think it's belief in in their capacity. So so some have a belief that they can do it, and others have a belief that they perhaps can't. And whether whether that comes from people around them, whether that comes from perhaps a childhood belief, um, there's those that are willing to challenge those beliefs and recognise that mm. it's simply just a belief, versus those who are taking that as truth. Mm. Because remember, I mean, on our podcast and, and in our tribe, we're constantly recognising that our thoughts are not in truth, right? Yeah. And that our beliefs are not truth. But but there is a whole section of 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 humanity who don't question what they think and believe yeah. what they think is real. Yeah. Um, and so if you're believing what you're thinking is real, then you're likely going to choose the path that seems the easier one or the safer one because that's what everything is telling you is the truth. Mm. Um, I think that the difference is that these women are, are um, challenging what they think you know, and challenging what they believe. So what has this documentary lit within you now? It's really inspired me to tell more stories and tell more stories through different mediums. You know, I'd love to make another another film and I'd love to do more interviewing and I'd love to just increase the platform for conversation around what I see as these these, these pinnacle parts of, of our consciousness that matter mm. um, and our stories that matter. And, you know, you and I have this... This brewing idea, don't we? Yeah, we do. We've talked about it. Mm. We'd really love to do a documentary that really focuses on the woman in the motherhood journey. Mm. Um, so, look, we're really also putting this out there that we'd love to invite our tribe in to ask the questions of essentially what we would like to ask in this documentary. We're interested in what is the thing or the things that you would most want to know about other women's lives behind closed doors? Mm. How do you want, what do you want to know? What are the questions you would ask if it, nothing was off limits and everything was going to be truth serum told? What would you want to ask of the mothers around you? Like that's really, we want to kind of pull back that yeah. mail, talk about the depth and the breadth of motherhood and, you know, really find some truth and some meaning out of that. So mm. we really invite you to send us a private message, an email, you know, get in contact through our Facebook page and just really put in your piece of, you know, I would really love to know the answer to this. You know, because as women, so, I so yeah. got that from your documentary yeah. last night that the one thing, because I was, you know, doing some Facebook lives for SOAR mm. on women that were attending the event and the, the one common theme was the women around them, mm. that all of those women had pivotal women in their lives. Yeah, who, were in, who had, had, had showed them what, what was possible. Right? Exactly, because if you don't have women around you mm. that say this is what's possible, you only think what's possible is what you see yeah. and what you know. Yeah. And this is that, you're almost like that, that factor of you, you're so influenced the by the, the five, five. The average yeah. of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah, exactly. And I just kept thinking, wow, you know, as women, we just are like fireworks. We just mm. light each other up. Yeah, and we're so much about relationship and connection. Yeah. So that's why I think we, we, we latch on so much to what we see around us because that becomes our defining version of what's possible yeah or not possible exactly mm. so I you know both you and I are really interested to know what our tribe would be really interested in knowing about yeah from motherhood women around them you know the average mother or the, the woman who's a celebrity like what is the mm. what's the key tenants that you would love to know day-to-day -day, reality based what do you want to know that she's doing or not yeah. doing or how she's doing or thinking or feeling like mm. what is those what are those questions so we really invite you to, to jump in with that because, yes, please you know, do because we're in the brewing is, process. We're in the research phase and <laughs> you are key to helping us get, get some great insights. Yeah, so mm. please jump on to nourishingthemother.com.au. You can send a message straight through the Facebook there. You can email us on connect at nourishingthemother.com.au. On Facebook and Instagram, you can message us or, you know, respond on a um, tile or a picture, which is nourishing the mother. Yes. Suburban Sandcastles, you can certainly connect with Bridget through Suburban Sandcastles. Yes, so your website do. is suburbansandcastles.com. Your course, next doco? Yes, that one's called Heal. So we're showing that one in Melbourne, Geelong, and Byron Bay. How exciting. Yeah, which is really cool. Um, and so if you're in those areas, I'd love to see you along to that event. Just tell us what Heal is about. It's all about how the mind essentially um, influences the body and that there is no separation. 
and the, the body is so often a barometer of, of our unconscious and conscious mind. And it's a really fascinating story of a couple of healing journeys and some really inspiring experts come together for the film. Um, yeah, it's just a beautiful story. So we've got some incredible... I was about to say, what panellists have you got, Bridget? Because yeah. you always have some great people I've got up. some really cool ones. So I've got an amazing guy who um, who had like a, had a brain tumour and was had a really life-threatening resulting result complications from that. And then he left his career from in, of investment banking once he recovered and then became a yoga and meditation teacher and travels around the world speaking. So he's, he's had perhaps one of the biggest identity shifts you can have, which I always find fascinating, the mm. identity crisis and then rebuilding of self that comes from that. So he'll that be sharing very his story. Yeah, and we've also got an integrative GP um, who's won quite a few awards in the Order of Australia as well, who's going to be speaking at our Melbourne event, which will be really great. So, yeah, lots of people coming together for this one. Oh, jump on to Heal. I'm mm. definitely going to come yeah, in November too. So and you can connect with me on thepleasurenutritionist.com. And we do just want to say thank you so much for listening. Yes. You know, we really wanted to just honour you, Bridget, in, in lighting up this world the way that you do oh, and thank you. continuing to show up even, I'm going to say, through the challenges of motherhood, which mm. is, I think, another added layer of, of mm. extra challenge. And that documentary was, you know, hugely inspiring and, and I think pivotal in that journey. So thank I really you. applaud you for thank that. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. And if you do have any questions, please, you know, direct them through to Bridget. If you're interested in a screening, they could certainly contact you yeah, through them sure. as well, couldn't yeah. they? And what else? Products page. We have a products page we that we keep forgetting page. to tell you about. We have put together all these PDFs and... Um, I can't think what else we've got audio sections yes. on all sorts of things that we talk about consciousness and questions and you know delving into your own dynamics and we always forget to say they are sitting there and I'm if so you're glad, interested but people are finding them because we're getting a lot we're getting lots and lots of um, lots and lots of purchases of those at the moment so it's really really great to see people jumping on board because they because they they're lovely little bite-sized products just to reinvigorate your week your day and really kind of bring that sense of consciousness and that sense of nourishment back to your mothering journey and back to yourself on this path um so that's what we've put together for you so please check that out so nourishing the mother.com.au forward slash products and remember you have to what am i saying nourish the mother nourish the mother to rock the family it's yes. our new motto we're working on it so hang in there with us while we work on it just polishing <laughs> and we'll see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey this has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.